Welcome back to my channel. I just noticed today that I'm approaching 2,000 subscribers. So if you're one of those 2,000 or nearly 2,000, just a quick thank you for subscribing to the channel. Uh, it's pretty humbling to see that so many people find uh, what I have to say of any, any value. So in this video, I want to talk about or discuss the idea of a commonplace book and how I've begun to implement my own digital version of it in Obsidian. I'm not quite sure where I ran across the idea of a commonplace book, but it's been something that's stuck in my mind for a long time. So a commonplace book is simply a way to compile knowledge. It became famous during the Renaissance period in the 19th century, which back then, of course, it was probably just a notebook or series of notebooks that contained uh, the digested knowledge that an individual had consumed. There's this one quote from How to Read a Book by Mortimer Adler that really kind of kicked off my interest or sparked the interest that I had in writing, creating my own commonplace book. And the quote is, uh, the full ownership of a book only comes when you have made it part of yourself. And the best way to make it part of yourself is by writing at it. And he was using it in context of showing you and instructing you on how to properly mark up a book with, um, you know, underlines and highlights and signifiers and stuff like that, which are immensely useful. And I do use those for reading. But with my nearly year-long venture into smart notes and the Zillowcast and method, method and note-taking, I couldn't help myself but take it a step further and implement it in a digital version with some notes. So what you're about to see is my current implementation of a commonplace book that captures the artifacts of intellectual, that captures the artifacts of analytical reading, and analytical reading is the third level of reading if you're familiar with Muttermere's levels of reading. But before we dive into that, um, and before you get super overwhelmed with the amount of information that's probably captured inside my commonplace book, I want to introduce you to yet another idea from how to read a book, which is the uh, book, the pyramid of books. And at the very, very bottom of that pyramid are uh, roughly exists 90% of the books that you'll read throughout your lifetime. And those are the ones that are merely worth um, looking over or glancing. And then if you go up one more level up to that, which is kind of like the next level of the foundation of the pyramid, there's another however much percent that will exist of all the books that are worth an inspectional read where you're flipping through them and you're reading them kind of superficially and you might make a few marks, but you probably aren't even going to take any notes in that. And then there's the kind of the top 10% of the pyramid, which makes the very, very tippy top. And then the next level that are the books that require you to exert a high level of effort to extract out all their knowledge. And at the very, very peak of that, there's what he calls the inexhaustible books that you can read over and over and continue to gain knowledge from. And what I'm going to show you in my commonplace book are books that I have identified as being in that top 10%. So this is not a tactic that I use for every single book that I read. It is books that I have found worthwhile that have given me something in return. And at least they're worth an analytical read of one pass, maybe more. So just keep that in mind as you as we navigate the structure, this is definitely not every single article that I read and every single book that I read. This is a very, very uh, minuscule or small amount, a select a selection of books from the broader realm. So that way you can just kind of let that be a breath of fresh air for you as you dive into this. This isn't something that you need to broadly apply everywhere. So here we are in Obsidian, and the first order of business that we will take care of here is to show what theme I'm using so I don't forget, because every time I create a video, I probably get at least one question around the themes. So if we go into appearance and we go to manage, we'll be able to see what theme. So I'm using the typewriter theme in the light mode. So if you like this background and whatnot and you wanna give it a try, it's the typewriter theme in light mode. And I like it because it hides the headings and it mimics the typewriter and there's something kind of romantic about the typewriter experience in my opinion. So if you can see here at the root directory, I have uh, th four folders, three of which are genres. So the way that I've kind of categorized this, because if you, if I took all the books that I read and I put them into a flat structure, I need at least some organization. So I've decided to just stick with the genre, which I could, you know, typically what I'll do is I go on Goodreads and I look at the most common genre that's been tagged in the book and then I put it in there. So right now I have um, writing. Well, let's start from the top. I have productivity, psychology, templates, and that's not a genre. That's just where my templates live for my notes. We'll look at that in a second. And then writing. Writing, I don't have anything under. I haven't ported anything over from my other knowledge base systems. I'm kind of in a re reshuffling. I do that probably every couple months. But let's take a look at psychology so we can see uh, what the commonplace book structure looks like. So I use this, this uh, plugin called Folder Note. So let's take a look at that real quick so you can see how I'm doing this folder, folder note uh, abstraction on top. So if we go into uh, community plugins, 
and we browse, there is a plugin called Folder Note. And it's really, I mean, the name kind of describes it. It allows you to use a folder as a note. And the way, the reason why I find that valuable is because I can use the folder as the index then. And then it's a note that I can continue to make sure that my backlinks and stuff like that create a hierarchy that I want, or at least a link structure and navigation structure that I want. Um, but it helps me to create the indexes for those notes. So I have that enabled. So if you were to look at the file system, there is a folder called psychology, and then there's a note or a file called psychology.md, and that is what's being displayed here. That, that plugin uh, just allows the folder to be presented as a note inside of Obsidian. So with that, we'll take a look at the metadata. So I do have one tag for categorizing these so that way in the graph view, you can see different colors based on different genres. And so I have the genre as a tag here so I could key off that in my groups. Uh, inside there, I just have bullets for two things that I've imported into my commonplace book, range and information overload. So range is a book by David Epstein. Uh, and then information overload is a research article or paper uh, that I've read that I've taken some extensive notes on that I found was valuable. So if we go inside range, this is what each note looks like. So this is the template. Uh, I started with the template of the template source book. And that's kind of gives me the, the rough structure here that I filled in. And we can take a look at that template in a second. But really what I wanted to record here and a lot of recommendations I've got is I want to write books and so forth is to record the bibliographical data so I have the author here, David Epstein. I have the title and subtitle here, if I was ever you know, curious about that, the publisher um, date and the ISBDN. And then I have a tag of books because I wanted to see, you know, I just wanted a way to filter. And so I'm still tinkering with the metadata. I don't know what's useful, but I figured at least categorizing the note as some kind of a source would be useful. Uh, the next thing that I want to call it that's important is the analytical outline. So how I've produced this content is I read the book and then taking Ryan Holiday's advice um, and uh, Motor Mirror Adler's advice, I marked up the book as I was reading it and then I let it sit on my shelf for probably about a week or two. And then I opened it up and I started to take notes and I started to read it again more analytically. Um, and what you see here are all the notes that I've uh, created from that. Now, I've done a, a physical version of the subbox and I've taken physical notes and I really like the idea of being able to see the visual index cards. And that's something that I've tried to mirror in my commonplace book, because I wanted to be able to filter through and be like, oh, here's range. I, my associative memory can remember the book title. I know this idea is in here. How do I organize and catalyze, uh, categorize that knowledge so I can find it again? And Mortimer Adler has some really great advice around taking ownership of the book, which is to re-outline the book in your own words. And so typically what I do, or what I've done in this case is I've, I've taken all my notes throughout the book and I put them in a folder and I put them in the range folder. So if we expand this, we can see that it has many more items in there, which are the, the result of this. But then being able to see all my notes, then I can kind of reshuffle them into their main points and ideas. And then I re-outline it. So I go kind of from the beginning of the book, what did David talk about first? And that's what I put in this first bullet. And then I continue on until the end. His kind of call to action is that you develop range. And so this hopefully represents my intellectual ownership now of the book. Um, and before we dive into the outline and the notes, you can see how I've made it present itself like I was kind of flipping through a slip box or a little shoe box of index cards. Let's look at some of the other things that I've done. Um, so typically there's three outcomes from a book or three artifacts of a book that I am interested in. One is the knowledge that I acquired, which is the notes, the, that's the analytical outline. The next is the future reading. So there's always more rabbit holes that you can dive down when you read a book. And so this is where I kind of capture those. I'm still trying to find the best way to manage a reading list, which has been kind of a nightmare for me, but it continues to grow. But this is where I capture, like here are the things that were interesting, whether they were papers or other books, or just things that I want to go and research that I wanted to, to look up from this. This one in particular, the desired difficulties, I really love that idea and I want to dig deeper into it. And so this is where I capture, like, where do I want to go from this book? So if I wanted to pick back up range or the ideas that were in range, where would I go next? And here's where I capture that information. And then lastly, like, who doesn't like some pithy and witty quotes from books that, they, that they've read? And so I've captured them here. I really like that idea from Readwise, but it just wasn't maintainable 
um, you know, because I prefer to read physical books and I'd have to scan it with a phone and stuff like that. So typically what I'll do is I'll, when I'm writing, I write just kind of like a, a greater than sign next to it, uh, the quote, and then I'll, I'll kind of just type them in as notes in here. And then I oftentimes try to include the page number so I can go back and get the original if I want. But those are the three elements that I capture as intellectual artifacts out of a book. So with that out of the way, let's take a look at the actual notes and how I've structured them. So if we expand range, uh, the reason why I love the folder note is I have the option to either click the links or I can click on the folders. Now, remember when I said I was doing the outline, I put the outline in the order of the book and how David presents his arguments. And that's a way to help me remember the sequence of his arguments and his, um, and his outline of the book. I can't really do that in the folder structure because it's alphabetical. I could use numbers, but that just annoys me. So I use the outline, but I can browse the ideas either way. So I can click on develop range here and it'll bring up the notes or I can click it here. So I love the ability to be able to browse from the bullet list and from the file structure because we're so used to browsing from the file structure. So as you can see here, um, all the notes are presented in the root folder of develop range and I can see them all. So it's, it's almost like I pulled that little piece develop range, that keyword, out of my, my shoebox and I laid out all my notes onto a table for that particular idea. And that's what I love so much about it. So I, you know, I've documented the source page of each and this is what's kind of backlinking to the main level note. Um, but this is, this is how I browse my notes. If I wanted to go in and I'm like, okay, I'm working on this piece or I have this idea of developing range, what are my existing notes on that? Um, and here I can quickly browse and see, and it helps me to keep my notes short and how I'm doing this, if you look at the syntax, is I'm just using the embedded note feature with the exclamation mark. So I'm linking to the note like normal, but I'm just putting that exclamation mark. So if I delete it, it just becomes a link. If I put that exclamation mark, I get a preview of the note. Um, and if I click this, it'll open the note precisely itself. So that's how I go about doing that. Um, and I can kind of scroll through, but then again, I can I can minimize develop range, I can expand learning environments, and here's how I have those notes. So I was finally able to figure out how to mirror that experience of being able to lay cards out on a table um, and move them around. Now the only downside here is I can't like reorganize them and sort them. It's kind of like just a linear top-down approach to that. Maybe there'll be some features in Obsidian later that allow you to move these elements around. I could from here create a workspace. That's an, an alternative idea where I could um, take these notes and ideas that are in here and I could resort them in a workspace temporarily and get that kind of like reorganization figured out. So th that's um, basically the gist of that. If we take a look at another book inside of um, productivity. So again, just walking through, I've got three books here or three pieces of knowledge inside my psychology branch, with range, information overload, and atomic habits. And if we expand productivity, I have a couple more. The one we'll look at in this video is A World Without Email by Cal Newport. So we're going to have the author here, all the, the bibliographical data. And then um, I haven't quite backfilled all this yet, but I need to find my quotes and future, future reading from this. But this outline is a little more, bit more extensive. And so you can see, based on the number of folders that I have here and the number of notes that I have inside this folder, um, how much knowledge I gain from that. And I'll, I'll spare, you know, kind of navigating through this. It's the same same experience, just the embedded cards. Um, but if we look at the graph view, it becomes kind of interesting because I can see which, uh, you know, I can kind of navigate by the genre, but then I can really see like which books had the most impact on me and how did I, like how many notes did I get from that? Like uh, the Time Block Planner from Cal Newport again, I actually took quite a few notes on that because it's been a revolutionary um, tactic for me to manage my time, but I can start to see here and just connect all the habits. The reason why I, I'm really enjoying the knowledge place more than the knowledge base is the way I've, I took a little break from the smart notes and I started to examine how my brain works as I write and how my brain works is I can remember the book that I got an idea from and sometimes even the chapter. And that's often how I'll write is I'll be outlining something. I prefer to read a bunch of stuff just as I'm interested in. And then eventually I have an idea for something to write. And then it's kind of like going through and backfilling all of that. I kind of view smart notes as 
if you're familiar with software development, like test-driven development. So it's kind of front-loading all of the decisions of how you want to make it work. And that just that way of thinking really tripped up my writing and I really struggled to, to follow through with it. I think it's a fantastic knowledge management system that you can that really forces you to look through the associations and if you're doing some deep research, it's really useful. But I think for me, um, right now I'm, I'm really enjoying the, the commonplace because it allows me to just like fully focus and capture all of the pertinent information from the particular resource without worrying about where it goes in the next stage of writing. But then when I go to write, I have this nice artifact of my learning that I can kind of pillage and go through, which is typically what I do when I wouldn't take notes is I would just grab the book off my, my bookshelf, like how to read a book here today, because um, I don't have my notes in the commonplace. And I would just flip through and look at my marks and try and find uh, the piece of information I wanted. So this is a nice visual representation of that. Where I see this becoming useful over time is I'll be able to see the links from knowledge. So an example, there's this idea of learning environments and range, kind and wicked, and there's different types of practice that are and experience that are better in each. And I'm reading another milk, uh, another milk, another book by, um, what's it? Uh, another book called Meltdown, and it also talks about the ideas of the idea of a kind learning environment and a wicked learning environment. And so it'll be neat to link those books together through those notes instead of trying to build an elaborate structure. Because I I tend to think in terms of knowledge acquired from books then knowledge structures that I've kind of created outside of the book myself. So with that, this is how I've been able to build my digital commonplace book. I hope you found this video was useful and thank you for watching.